Okay, we might get started given it's coming up on five past. Um, hello and welcome to the second in a series of architectural panel discussions hosted by Reclaim Holloway as part of the London Festival of Architecture. My name is Rachel Shoiga. I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Kent, and I've been a member of Reclaim Holloway since just after the prison's closure in 2016. I'll be moderating tonight's discussion and setting the scene for our panelists to discuss feminist architecture as it relates to the planned women's building on the site of Holloway Prison. But before we begin, we'd like to pause for 72 seconds of silence to mark the fourth anniversary of the Grenfell fire and the deaths of 72 people in that avoidable disaster and to mark our solidarity with those fighting for justice and the safety of housing around the country. Thank you very much. Okay, so this series of panel discussions are centered around this particular site in North London, the former site of Holloway Prison, which is a site loaded with history and memory of feminist struggle and the brutalization of women. The panel discussions are designed to raise awareness around the current status of the development and to hear from architects, activists, and academics on pressing questions of design, legacy, and the potential of the site before the plans are formally submitted for planning. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Helen Aston of Praxis and the Manchester School of Architecture, by Sophie um, from the Edit Collective, and Liza Fior from Wolf Architecture and Art, um, and also by Christine Murray from the Developer and Festival of Place. Before I invite our panelists to speak, I want to set out the structure of the event and do some quick housekeeping. So I'll begin with a very brief introduction to the site and where the current development stands and explain what Reclaim Holloway have in mind in advocating for a women's building on the site. Then each of our speakers will have five minutes or so to introduce themselves and offer some initial reflections on what it would look like to follow principles of feminist architecture in designing the Holloway Women's Building. I'll pose a few more questions around feminist architecture and the wider industry and the potential of this building. And we'll keep five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. As questions come to you throughout the talks, please pop them immediately or when they come to mind into the chat box and I'll put them to the speakers toward the end of the event. Our event is being recorded and our amazing artist, Nikki Gibbs will also be drawing the content of the conversation. Please make sure that you're following us on Twitter to see last week's incredible illustration of ideas and the one that emerges from this evening's conversation. Hopefully the quite restrictive approach that we've taken will be quite will be enough to prevent Zoom bombing, but if it does happen, we'll end the meeting, take a few minutes to check in on the speakers, and if our speakers are happy to continue, the meeting will reopen and the session will continue. Okay, so to give you some background to begin, Reclaim Holloway is an abolitionist coalition made up of women with lived experience of Holloway, women sector workers, academics, activists, architects, and local residents. The prison closed in 2016 and this large public site in North London went up for sale. We mobilize to make sure that the development is socially just and actually serves the public and to advocate for an appropriate and meaningful legacy for the prison and the thousands of women who were imprisoned there since 1852. The Holloway Prison site is an incredibly important site for women's history and women's rights, with a complicated and distressing history of punishment and the state control of women. But the site also holds a remarkable history of women's resistance and survival. So the image that might immediately come to mind for those familiar with the prison's history is that of imprisoned suffragettes being force fed in Holloway while on hunger strike. But we might also consider the resistance of thousands of less famous women who survived and those who did not survive the institution as part of the feminist history. 
Prison has long been used as a, as a means of controlling women, punishing those who transgress or challenge the social order, particularly in relation to women's sexuality, and as a means of reinforcing gender norms in society. Criminalization and imprisonment of women is also very clearly mapped onto structural disadvantage, marginalization, and institutional racism. Working class women of color in particular are subject to othering, exclusion, and control through the carceral state and its institutions. And by the carceral state, I mean the state that uses incarceration as a political approach to managing social problems. Reclaim Holloway want to see things done differently. On this site, we want to see a transformative shift in direction from imprisonment to meaningful, non-punitive support and care for women. It's always worth pointing out, I think, that the vast majority of offences committed by women, roughly 85%, are non-violent and tend to be linked to poverty or drug addiction. Women in prison are also highly likely to have suffered serious abuse in their lives. And sending women to prison often makes things worse, causing homelessness, the loss of jobs and support networks, and often custody of women's children. So since the prison closed, we've advocated for an inclusive, transformative space of support for women in the community. Through Holloway Prison, many charities and non-state organizations offered support for those in prisons, including drug and alcohol rehabilitation, psychotherapy, art and creative programs, training and employment, and other services. And when the prison closed, many of those services were lost. We want the Women's Building to offer these services in the community, in a safe, welcoming, and, and holistic environment, in a place where organizations can do their work in a joined up way without the precarity caused by high rents. So prison architecture has its own historical trajectory with the goals of the criminal justice system materially expressed through imposing architecture, which is designed to deter potential criminals and to signal the power of the state. More recently, new prisons are often indistinguishable from warehouses or other industrial buildings. And we might think of these as a visual metaphor for the lack of public empathy for the excluded criminal. What we want to think about today in this session is what a feminist design of the women's building would look like. So how can this building, which has the potential to be a living legacy for Holloway, to mark out a change in direction in how we treat women in society, moving from punishment to support. How can this building materially express that intention? So we're organizing these events because we're concerned that ours is a much more expansive vision than that what is currently offered by Peabody developers and designed by AHMM, their architects. So Peabody bought the site in 2018 with a 42 million loan and 39 million grant funding from the Greater London Authority. This is public land, bought with public money, and it should be shaped by public voices and commitments, particularly the voices of women, given the feminist history of the site. We campaigned for an open architectural competition to be launched for the building to be designed by female architects with a vision for the site, but this didn't happen. So the developers are bound by the council's planning document to provide a base for women's services and a safe space in which multiple services can be accessed in one building. But what's currently being proposed is a ground floor of a residential block with insufficient space to offer a home for women's services or create a safe space for social support. And the entrance itself is reminiscent of the prison entrance and far from the iconic inspirational women's building that we think that women deserve and appropriate to honoring the history of the site. So at that, I'm going to invite our panel members to introduce themselves and to offer some initial reflections around the question, how can the women's building development evolve to become an exemplary model of feminist architecture? So Helen, if you'd like to begin, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. I, I've prepared a little bit of written script just because I can be known to chat for too long. So I'm looking at another screen, I apologise. So um, my name's Helen Aston, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Manchester School of Architecture. Um, so a little bit about me, and I kind of always start presentations like this because I think it's really um, good to kind of state your claim. So I'm a feminist, I teach, I collaborate, I participate, I design, I build and I propose things. And I like discussing it as well. 
I've been teaching architecture for around 25 years and have always in various forms taught in a feminist way. From running a women's only conference in Bradford, um, age 21, working with female community leaders in numerous uh, council estates to attempt to subvert top down regeneration uh, back in the mid um, early 1990s um, with those from uh, to building with those who don't normally build and working with hundreds of students to develop socially inclusive projects to running an explicitly intersectional feminist design studio called Praxis at Manchester School of Architecture. We like to discuss and question normative structures and we always call things out within our department. I'm not afraid to use the F word, which is, of course, I mean, feminist, um, although I do swear a lot as well. Um, <laughs> the thing I'm really, really passionate about is about cre creating cities and places and spaces for equity and of equity. So these may include various aspects, which I'll probably come to over the, um, the nature of the evening. Um, but for me, all of the, the issues that we work to are the kind of primary drivers for all our projects rather than just bolt-ons or afterthoughts or tokenism or tick boxes. So I think there's two issues to play at, the, at, at play here, with the, which are the barriers and then the opportunities. And that's really important for any project that we get involved in. Um, so one of the things that many of our projects are concerned with um, and concerned about rather, are to try to interrupt and disrupt and propose alternatives um, in response to what we're seeing as um, social injustice. And especially where there's absolutely deep rooted marginalization or exclusion and usually exclusion rather. Um, whether it's a, it's a lack of parity or transparency or a lack of access to a building or a lack of access to services, education, public space, or just the ideas required to enable unheard voices to be heard. And that's, I think that's really pertinent in this context. Um, and it's those unheard voices and the voices, the kind of community perspectives in all its versions and iterations that is absolutely critical to all the discussions that take place. So it's about who and how we can work together. We were asked the, the following question, which was about how the women's building development evolved to become this exemplary medal, uh, medal, model of feminist architecture. So absolutely bottom line, I think it should be totally about equity rather than equality um, and a right to feel be, to feeling included and a right to justice and one that has an absolute legacy to move forwards rather than only kind of reflecting backwards. The way I try to approach things in my teaching and in my research and in practice is through exploring these opportunities and then scenarios tend to um, emerge from there with common issues, chances, considerations, not the traditional kind of what I call like a technocentric approach, which often has problems that you produce a solution and then you walk away. So surely from this, uh, we have a more equitable society or a more feminist society, um, which is better for everyone. So for me, the women's building shouldn't be just limited to a building, but to the creation of a series of social spaces and I see, I see that in a very, very broad way, which but to ex, to explicitly acknowledge the inclusion and contribution of others through forms of agency. Primarily, it should be created based on people's capabilities and own personal knowledges. And I think that's really, really important in coordination with the kind of local social infrastructure or what's not there in the local social infrastructure of the place and its local residents, workers, stakeholders, etc. Um, and a better place to access missing services. It needs to go beyond the physical access and the design of space, but to consider the links to what you might call social prescribing and the primary need for connection of individuals to others. I think it could alter and subvert the existing uh, proposals um, and the existing systems on the site about making and becoming different, about fundamentally changing what the developer only considers really um, as the bottom line money and profit and to can create so totally socially embedded networks in which the consequences the consequences of the architecture are much are much more significant than the objects i.e just the building of the architecture that's me for now <laughs> 
that's great thank you very much Helen that's fantastic um okay next up we've got Alice and Sophie from Edit Collective thank you so much for being here with us um we do have somebody who is hard of hearing in the meeting so if you could try to be slow <laughs> and um, a little bit louder than normal that would be fantastic thank you very much thank you very much for inviting us I'm gonna try to share my screen all right so again thank you very much for inviting us we well i'm alice and this is sophie and we are presenting edit today um edit is a feminist design collective based in london um most of us met at uh, university and um where we share common interests and this led us to uh, form uh, in 2018 uh, and we have been asked in the past why we describe ourselves as a feminist and collective. And by this, we don't mean that we just happen to be a collective of feminists, uh, which we are. We are. Uh, but the description also refers to the way we practice. And uh, as a feminist and collective, we, uh, uh, we try to uh, practice uh, in a feminist way and practice with others in a feminist way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the way we approach a lot of our work, um, sort of uh, talking about how we practice in a feminist way, is to make all of the work we produce as inclusive as possible and really accessible and playful. Um, we do a lot of research about some quite um, big and serious topics that affect everyone, but that we feel need to be translated in a much more playful way to get people to sort of think about these ideas that haven't necessarily had the privilege of a gazillion years of architecture school and access to amazing academics and stuff like that. So we use stuff like GIFs, um, collages, photo montages, objects that you can actually use that are recognisable but slightly tweaked. Um, our first project uh, together was is called Honey and Home, and it's a research project that looks at the domestic space and how um, basically it can be considered as a, almost like theatrical sets in which the routines are actually uh, continuing over and over, and they're not being actually questioned enough. So the design of the house and design of the objects within it are actually, uh, in our opinion, not really. Uh, provoked and really uh, um, we just basically take them for granted and all of these kind of collages and uh, fictional narrative and uh, fictional futures uh, that we produce are actually uh, meant to provoke uh, a discussion on, on these issues and they're not meant to be taken as a um, as a solution in, in whatever way but um, just really uh, to provoke uh, different ideas uh, about what it means to actually uh, live together. Uh, we use this um, um, kind of uh, popular culture images to basically, because they basically embed a lot of heteronormative and um, uh, kind of traditional settings, which we aim to like kind of dismantle in a way. And is that coming up Oops, um sorry. yeah so looking at the way we want to provoke um people who see our projects um to rethink the way we live together um especially at home um we sort of tweak Ooh. different scales um so this project sorry. oh are we, what can you say can you see the hover i'm so sorry this slide is going to um hopefully you can see anyway can see maybe. and we can yeah. see um, this project yeah. was called the gross domestic product um, and we chose a domestic cleaning device as um, yeah I think it might have skipped to another side um, but as an object that's obviously very heavily associated with women's labour in the home um, and we wanted to tweak it to unpick the sort of gendered performances that happen in the home that are very well established um, and also to unpick the sort of capitalist presumptions that domestic labour is um, is most efficiently done by one person and that person often being the woman so sort of um tweaking this object uh, to only be able to be used by three people at once and how does that transform our view of domestic labor and who it should be done by and is it a chore is it could it be a social act those sorts of ideas um and this slide that we're a bit stuck on here sorry is um ah oh no sorry 
why is it it's skipping to the it's next skipping one to the next... do you want to try and go back um i'm trying sorry i'm talking slightly out of sync here but the previous slide um was uh, a piece called a woman of color enters the workplace um written by sagel one of the other editors and it's been published in now you know which is a book that looks um, looks at uh, the experiences of racism of architectural practitioners in the workplace and wider parts of the industry. So yeah, as well as looking at issues of gender, we also look at lots of other intersectional issues of um, racism within the industry. Um, and then our most recent project uh, has been an exhibition called How We Live Now, uh, where we were commissioned by Barbican to design the structure um, to show, it's the first showing of um, Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative's work, um, and they worked a lot around um, feminist issues in the built environment. Um, and one of their sort of yeah, their main books, Making Space, really is an amazing piece of research um, about how a man-made environment just doesn't think about the needs of women, and therefore lots of other people that can't move around the city um like the male architects that were designing these sort of spaces um yeah so we collaborated with a number of different people on the project and our aspiration was to look at how do you present a an archive of feminist work in a feminist way um and we wanted to create a space that didn't feel super institutional, something that felt the scale of something more domestic um, with much sort of like softer qualities for people to linger in the space and sort of really, um, really feel sort of included in the work of Matrix and the way that um, the archive is displayed um, and also to sort of learn and feel agent in the process maybe by displaying them more as tools. Um, and the, the structure. Sorry, Alice and Sophie, can I just interrupt you for a second just yeah. to ask you to slow down just a little, just for the woman who is sure. a bit hard of hearing. Sorry. I'm really sorry. sorry. We were aware of talking too much. But um, yeah, the, the structure essentially, so Matrix's work was a lot about unveiling the process of what it takes to make a building. And through that, trying to open up who can design those spaces, who feels agent in. Um, who feels empowered to have an input um, because they worked with a lot of community groups and more marginalized groups. Um, so one of our sort of main things around how we wanted the space to feel was to unveil how things are built. So there's a number of wooden modules which um, mimic the sort of timber carcassing that you usually find um, on the interiors of buildings. Uh, there's a continuous curtain rail um, that has a number of different curtains that can be drawn to create smaller, more intimate spaces. Um, and that sort of weaves in and out of the structure, sort of like how plumbing pipe work would. So this, this line actually shows um, uh, the work that uh, we did with other uh, collaborators, like Louise Farley of Ladywood, which is an amazing fabricator, and uh, uh, Rachel, Rachel Jones, Jones. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and uh, Hannah Coley of Coley Studio, uh, which uh, they dyed naturally the fabric and uh, they worked on the design of the curtains. And for us, working with them was actually a process, a very collaborative process, and we tried to make it as um, kind of non hierarchical as possible as well, because of course they had uh, much more experience with these processes that we had. And so it was a really nice um, kind of way of working together. Um, we were also commissioned to design an alternative catalogue uh, and the graphic identity for the exhibition. Um, and rather than focusing on metrics alone, uh, the pack, uh, which is kind of a, a pack of atom resources, showcases the work of different uh, contemporary organisations uh, and the work of these collectives that lights voices that are often uh, marginalised in architecture and design. Uh, as well as including, of course, some um, brain temperate materials uh, from the Matrix archive. And sorry, I think we spoke too long and I really apologize for the mismatch of the slides, but I think that's it. And I guess we wanted to speak a bit about what we think uh, about the design. Yeah, the question that you posed about how the um, how the women's building is an opportunity to be like an exemplary model of feminist architecture. I also wrote a few notes. <laughs> just because there's a lot of things to say like you did but um yeah so for us um in edit when we're thinking about 
what is feminist architecture, which of course we also get asked a lot as a feminist architecture collective. Um, it's not, we don't see it as an aesthetic question or necessarily um, just a, like such a gendered question as you might first think. Um, we don't see feminist spaces as just spaces for women, but as intersectional spaces, which are non-hierarchical and are accessible and welcoming and empowering for everyone. Um, and of course, in the context of a women's centre, um, which will be uh, a mixture of communal uses and care services, um, it's a really great testing ground to unlearn um, the spatial um, logics which allow a lot of existing uh, civic and communal and sort of like public institutional buildings to reproduce these power structures of difference and a lot of the things that the women who had um, been incarcerated in Holloway would have um, been victims to those structures so it's a really interesting place to test that um, and obviously super poignant that the Women's Centre is on that site. Um, so for instance, within the building, um, when it's being designed, maybe rethinking ways that uh, spaces in lots of institutions separate service users and service providers and how, how that makes, um, how that affects the way that service users feel, how that, um, how that can have a real impact on creating a really like uh, egalitarian feminist space. Um, and transforming the way that services can be provided in a potentially much more non-hierarchical way. Um, and we also feel that there are a lot of sort of institutional design tropes that are now passed off as pragmatic or need or necessary for uh, service providers' safety, which are actually like really have their roots in disciplinary architectures, like the way prisons were designed as these architectures for surveillance. So it's be really interesting to unlearn those things. Um, and as well as the building being non-hierarchical and um, the process needs to be just as non-hierarchical. So really, um, so really uh, sort of um, foregrounding the users in the forum that's created that the design will come out of and making them feel really empowered to convey what their needs are so this is like completely de-establishing the idea of an architect or designer being an expert but that they're the experts in the space that they need that will support them um sorry for rambling <laughs> i hope some of that made sense um but yeah thanks for listening everyone we'll let someone else speak for a bit now <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you very much, both of you. Thanks. Um, okay, so the next speaker that we have is Liza Fjord. I believe you're here, Liza, if you'd like to take the floor. Yeah. Um, I'm just before before going on, I've just give it put a uh, so hello, my name is Liza Fjord from Muff Architecture Art. But I've just put a, um, a website for the Magpie Project, who work with um, women, mothers, uh, in, uh, who have no recourse to public funds. And we're just we're, um, supporting them at the moment because they're looking to a new building. And interestingly, that separation, spatial separation between services, serv the services with, um, and users is something they're trying to find um, new models of shared spaces to break it down. So I'll, I'll definitely make a con connection for you because these are very similar conversations that are being, um, that are being, being had um, that they're trying to, uh, yeah, kind of also change the preconceptions of where knowledge resides so i've i have i've just got a few slides as i was invited to bring um and and i i hope that they that will be useful just for making um a prompt of some ideas and i've noticed recently that um one has to do this slowly because otherwise uh some people don't see the slides so I am going to share my screen. All right. Sorry about that. It would be nice to have full screen, but it doesn't seem to want to do it. Has anyone got any top tips quickly in the chat? Nope. OK. Um, so what, when uh, Muff's first project that we ever did um, back in 1995 was for a museum of women's art, 
and um, it was a feasibility study for a new museum of women's art in London. We demonstrated perhaps a, a lack of commercial sense because our proposal to our clients, which was a group, uh, um, a campaigning group for this building, was that they shouldn't have a building. Instead, they should that the women's art that was currently hidden in basements should actually be foregrounded and given its own own exhibition. And that's something, you know, some of those artists, um, you know, for, for example, uh, finally got their, their National Gallery show. And so we concentrated more on the space, um, the sort of space that was missing and that was constrained in women's lives, um, along with that idea that it would be a paradox to, to, um, to make that containment for that work. Um, other early projects included Shore Start on the Ocean, which was um, a space to make space of celebration for women um, in Stepney in a situation that once married um, and becoming mothers, uh, the status of those um, young women was low and working, working with them to establish what that architecture might be. And probably over time, um, that can, those, those thoughts about a space for women, you know, became um, the idea of spaces of for more than one thing at a time, where your identity isn't absolutely fixed. And the idea of the role of um, public space, sorry, something's really miserable, is happening. But anyway, I'm just going to pretend I can't. So the idea of how do you make spaces of dignity where the challenges of everyday life um, are given space and where there can be moments of um, sort of, yeah, moments of honouring the everyday and the everyday challenges of people's lives. And Barking Town Square, you know, became in a way more and more urgent as the, as the housing crisis kicked in. So, um, so, um, for example, that with the benefits cap, um, the, the amount of rent you, you're allowed to have means that large families are living in one bedroom flats. And so this is Barking Town Square, where in the centre of the town square, between the, uh, the town hall and an arboretum of trees that we planted, um, is a stage. And the stage is the size of a one bedroom flat. And what's interesting in year 10 is that um, it's becoming more and more used. The idea that it is this space of slippage, this extra space, um, this outside room. I mean, I'm, and I'm going to get to your building in a, sec in a second. So, so the idea of places to be alone together as well as places that are big enough for the gathering that home might not allow for. Um, and that uh, to be a woman doesn't mean that you're a mother, but um, how do you make nonverbal gestures of permission to spend time in a space? So this is a child bench next to an adult one, but there's other um, acts of spatial permission that can be made. I think COVID has really revealed um, ne the necessary spaces uh, that we need, what the bare minimum a space is, and, and that somehow women's spaces usually have been the bare minimum. They have been the leftover, the marginal. What Edit achieved with their exhibition, The Barbican, was incredible. But in a sense, you know, unreasonably incredible, the squeezing in and the, the richness that was in, achieved in the middle of a corridor. And I'm just going to sort of end with a couple of generous spaces, um, the idea of having more space than enough. So this is the Brixton Wreck um, in Brixton, built, uh, finished in, eight, in 1985 and um, during lockdown. Uh, the swimming pool was closed, but when you visit there, that even though the budget was tight, you see the um, generosity 
the way that daylight is, daylight is brought deep into the space and this notion of public luxury. And I think the idea of public luxury is an essential idea for your building of not a bare minimum. Um, spaces to look down from, to be able to move into the space slowly, to be able to have multiple degrees of, um, of, 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 of entry, um, of an openness, and and also that it was big enough. So when the bowling hall was designed, no one assumed that it was going to become the hub for a thousand meals, um, uh, a thousand weekly boxes of food to be um, sent out to those shielding. But I think what it demonstrates is the need for extra, for the extra space which hasn't been planned. And that this, for me, is the mark of a civic building because it's not trying to um, predetermine every single um, occupation that you might might need and and its identity. And the other um, successful art. So we're working at the moment in in Brixton on that project. Is um, the second example is the Dawson Eastern Curve which was a leftover space, a space that hadn't been used, a space that was fly tipped. And it was initially made as a temporary space, but its, its necessity was demonstrated through use. And again, um, during lockdown, when it wasn't open to the public, they extended the invitation to groups who wouldn't otherwise, vulnerable groups who wouldn't otherwise meet. And so they came to the garden uh, the, the, and perhaps this is another hint for your building, because when I think um, of unsuccessful women's buildings, I think of the women's library in Allgate, which was completely impossible. Uh, I, I did, designed three exhibitions there to adapt in any way because the architects had wanted to celebrate women and made a very solid and fixed building, whereas the Dawson Eastern Curve was able to remake itself and in doing so, um, the garden and this big roof became a host space for multiple people to come. Sorry that for the technical problems, but thank you so much for um, allowing me to just begin to think of some of these questions. Thank you, Liza. Don't worry at all. It definitely happens to all of us. <laughs> and thank you for all of those ideas. That was really amazing. I think this notion of having generous spaces is very compelling and I think very appropriate to thinking about the women's building. Um, and I think that kind of, yeah, the idea of extra, one of the issues that's been coming up for us in our campaigning and conversations with the developers is this um, kind of fighting against the idea that flexible space is enough to work with if we have flexibility, but actually we're asking for a generosity of space, for more space for services, for more space for women um, and moving away from the disciplinary kind of logic that Sophie and Alicia talked about. Um, so that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I think I think also let, let's, um, let's capture Rona's point and perhaps that's something else we talked about, uh, I talked about, I hope in my ex examples was to keep moving between the spatial and the social infrastructure. And so Rona's point of designing, the idea of designing a different structure of um, service provision at the same time as this different structure of the space, um, I think it's really, really powerful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for picking up on that. Okay, so we're on to our last speaker. And we're very close on time also. Um, so I'll just invite Christine Murray to speak. Um, and please do get your questions in the chat and we'll try to save a few minutes at the end uh, to post them to the speakers. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's really great to be here and to share this uh, venue with um, so many speakers. Um, my name is Christine Murray. I'm the editor-in-chief of a publication called The Developer and the director of the Festival of Play Place. And before that, I, um, I was the editor-in-chief of the Architects Journal and the Architectural Review. Um, and through my work there, I, I founded the Women in Architecture Awards, which was my 
attempt to hijack the awards recognition system in architecture to raise the profile of women in architecture. Um, and I've since uh, been working with Part W, which is an action group um, about representation. So last week I ran an event called Festival of Place, Gender Equal Cities, and in some ways a lot of my views have been freshly shaped by the speakers there. Um, and what came across as really important was not just widened pavements and public spaces where you don't feel stared at. Interestingly, that came up a lot, this idea that we create public spaces where we can watch women and they feel quite exposed to being catcalled and, and et cetera. So, um, so what came across was not, not just that that's Im important, but that also um, we need to think about uh, how we not just level the playing field by making gender equal design considerations, but also, and not just provide equal seats at the table, but actually look at how we can tackle some of the root causes by which women are made unequal. Um, so I would, I would ask around, uh, to address this question of the women's building. So one question I would ask is whether these principles of, of gender mainstreaming will be followed in the architecture of the wider development. So why stop at this building space? What is going on in the master plan? Will the women and children in these new homes, affordable or otherwise, be safe from domestic sexual emotional abuse, which we know goes on to participate in the criminalization of women? Will their mental health be supported adequately in that community? What are the pollution, environmental and transport stressors facing them? What kind of community support would they have? And will this master plan as a whole follow the urban design and planning principles of gender mainstream? mainstreaming, which have been laid out so clearly. Um, Vienna has a free handbook and other resources, um, which have, a, you know, really uh, simple um, guidelines, such as having no more than 30 apartments off a single entranceway, so that you actually can recognize um, if there's someone in the apartment that you feel um, unsafe, and you can create a neighborhood in which you have a certain degree of, of support. Um, so that's one question that I have. And I think the other question that came out of something Leslie Kern pointed out last week, the author and academic, was that sometimes um, if you have things like a woman's building, um, you, could, you could end up seeing this as a symbolic act done by Peabody or as part of the development, uh, but that if it doesn't have some kind of um, system change, uh, it could be just a symbolic act um, and in fact, it could, you know, allow them to continue to maintain the status quo and point to the women's building as an indication of change when in fact no deeper change has taken place. And that's not to argue for a lack of women's spaces, but I think this project is in danger, as was stated in the opening, of becoming tokenistic. So what is the approach if it becomes a token? Um, is that to spread out and demand more space across that wider master plan, looking at those public spaces and actually the design of that housing? Um, or is this about fighting uh, for that space itself, um, which, which has been marginalized and going from building now to, to ground floor? So um, in fact, one of the things recognized in the talk was that many of those fights for representation on boards or positive discrimination or some of the equal pay fighting have benefited primarily white women. So it feels important to recognize that a fight for the women's building in this development may not meet intersectional needs and keeping that front about centering who and what we are going to place at the heart of that. So this, um, the thing that comes, comes up again, I was reading the Prison Reform Trust, the 60% of women in prison reported having suffered domestic violence. Um, many of them report emotional, physical, or sexual abuse as a child. So my question would be, you know, how, if we are going to tackle some of the root uh, systemic causes of imprisonment, um, then how can we ensure that we are creating a space in which domestic violence, sexual violence, abuse, catcalling is seen as um, unacceptable and in fact is kind of prevented from taking place. So um, I'm going to wrap up quite quickly there uh, and just so that you have a bit more time for questions, et cetera, but I, um, I'm happy to pick up if anyone wants more. <laughs> Amazing, thank you very much, Christine. Um, if people do have questions, please do pop them in the chat. I don't see any coming in so far. Um, 
But yeah, I wanted to pick up on what you said, Christine, about this idea of having an, an integrated community around the women's building. And I think as a coalition, we're really attentive to this notion that structural disadvantage and social harm happens within the prison as well as outside the prison walls. And that it is this kind of, kind of um, reproduction of harm that happens through the prison space and thinking about how to address that in the community and to really build efficient communities where people can care for each other. Uh, this is what we're hoping for. <laughs> um, okay, I don't see any questions popping in. But... I just had a little comment, um, just sort of thinking at that point you made um, is, uh, this is, and this is, this is quite an old memory um, because I know people who ran the art studio at Holloway Prison, mm. where it was a place of um, respite and uh, yeah, of, of, of uh, sort of a place of solace. And so I think that's, that's sort of interesting. Um, but also, um, but, but uh, also perhaps that, you know, one response to Christine is the fact that Reclaim Holloway is happening means that the master plan has scrutiny and um you know maybe that's something that uh those who are at this session who are practiced in reading plans can do is to support you in making sure that as the plans come forward and the consultations happen that the lens that christine and you lot have talked about does happen those questions of accessibility, those questions of, um, you know, what what will it mean to to live in the flats? What are the communal spaces like, etc.? So perhaps that's a form of support: is that the um, reclaim Hol Holloway as a space starts now by being um, a critical voice to the emerging overall design. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think in some ways we've been invited into a process of conversation with the council and the developers, but we don't feel like our voices are being listened to. So these events are hoping to open up the conversation because some of our members who are architects have talked about how there's very little discussion in the architecture industry of this site, which holds so much importance and um, yeah, we hope that this is kind of a space where we can open up the conversation and bring more people in, and especially those who have the skills to be able to support us in a practical way and put pressure on the developers for a more equitable design. I mean, one um, one thing is you ask how much things cost, you know, and, and, and uh, so that you're aware of that. But I'm just answering Jennifer Turner's question of how can you carve out space for excess when, um, you know, when budgets are tight, um, so number one is uneven spend. You know, where is money being spent and what what is it doing? Um, secondly, is one of the things is the presence of children is one of the few ways that you can ask for space because there's something called child yield, which is the amount of open play space. The London plan now describes play space that it should be playable space um for all i've got my I want the, they want my camera on. yeah there should be playable space for all ages i.e intergenerational like public realm should be intergenerational so i think there's a few ways that um the the space it, the the requirement to um have invested in spaces is inscribed into the planning system and it's sort of giving uh, you collectively the fluency of how to to pick it up. Oh wow! Look, there's somebody here from the no Trades Build Women Building Bridges, the North American Network of Women Working in Construction Trades. How amazing! Yes, and Liza, I, I noticed that the that the site has quite a few courtyards. It seems to have kind of public spaces and courtyards. And I was thinking about your work, you know, the work that you've done at King's Crescent and stuff. And just, I mean, the potential to kind of break out of just the women's building and really influence the provision and what happens in those communal spaces. Yeah, I think, I mean, we see now that courtyards are a failure because if you want to make mixed tenure shared spaces, also the work that Diana Bonnet 
did about um, the fact that few people will give their child a fob, like the electronic key, because they cost £25. And so that, you know, who's in the courtyards becomes very limited. Um, and so that the investment in social spaces, whether it's for play and other uses along routes and in the sort of the everyday spaces is um, is really worth pursuing. But I think I think probably the best way to operate is at multiple points at the same time. Um, so that you, you know, different different parts of your organization are, are critiquing their overall plan and not being um, put in the box of the women's building. Um. Okay, I'm afraid we're gonna to have to start winding up at that. Um, I wonder if I could get a few more words from maybe both Helen and from the Edit Collective, just as a response maybe to the existing plans as you've seen them. What do you think that the architectural plans that have been put forward at this point are sufficient in terms of the feminist design principles? Do you want to, sorry, do you want to go first? Um, did you want to start? Did you want to say any answer? Uh, no, I, I just uh, wanted to comment on the uh, the concept that Liza um, spoke about before, which was called um, public luxury. And I think the plans that are in place at the moment, they do not allow for that. I mean, they, they, they do not explain that. I don't know, they, they do not translate into that. And, uh, and unfortunately, wording something like a public luxury to a developer, that might not get you anywhere. And I think that's uh, it's important for us to understand that the, the thing that makes space um, feminist is is also that. Uh, and uh, but as also our other panelists have said, maybe there are ways in which regulations and planning laws work in your advantage, and and they're worth exploring uh, and. And, and since you have architects within the group, that's that's also, it's almost like he, in the consultation speaking almost another language uh, in order to um, to get somewhere in which you you are like you feel like you could be happy with. And and I and I hope you get another kind of round of consultation. And uh, and it, it sometimes it's really about the language that you speak uh, that makes a difference. Um, even though it's 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 almost misleading, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's... that's a very useful tip. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Helen, do you want to offer? Yeah, I think. Closing? Yeah, thank you. I think that it's a well. I guess the current response is a totally lost opportunity, where um, it's a commercial it's a commercial unit which is going to end up kind of staying the same um, commercial spe type space, which is just through a, some notional uh, gentrification or profit-making process. Um, and I think that's really dismissive, it's arrogant, it's patronizing towards, you know, there's, there's, it feels like there's no women in the brief, um, which is uh, slightly ironic, uh, slash um, totally inadequate to be perfectly honest. Um, and I guess for me, I'm kind of interested in like, who works there, who manages it, who are the designers of it. It's currently being led by, uh, being designed by an all-male-led practice. Um, why is it not being led by a women-led, female-led practice or women-led, con sorry, uh, consultants? And I think that's absolutely a shocker for me. Um, and I guess who's going to work there? Um there's something about the lack of kind of acknowledgement of the heritage of the site. And whilst I'm not kind of going down that road necessarily, although it is a site of contentious heritage, of course. Um, but I think for me, I kind of want to see it develop into something where there's the kind of new memories are made and new collective memories are made and told. So um, maybe be in a space of kind of new new views of, of women and the identity of women within within not just that site but within the kind of 
local community. But definitely a space of permanence because I think the notion of just having this kind of rectangle uh, plot of uh, flexible space, which never exists as, as um, other speakers have, have uh, referred to, is just an impossible, insulting kind of design proposition for the for the project. I mean, Peabody have made a commitment. We're working with them at the moment. They've made a new uh, commitment to to co-design, and and you know the what you know what that might mean, and how to, um, as you suggest, Helen, open things up. Uh, that the planning, you know, planning the consultation period is is very um, important. Yeah, my concern is having looked at the public consultation, they really do, you know, celebrate this idea of the women's building, but it doesn't sound very truthful to what they're actually proposing to do. So that sense of feeling used might come through this, that kind of tokenism that could actually, I think, be quite hurtful to everyone who is involved and engaged in this campaign. So how to head that off, I think, and how to make that unacceptable um, make that tokenism unacceptable and to be sure that we are not participating in it, I think feels really important. Absolutely, absolutely. That thing rings very true. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that many of us involved in the campaign are struggling with this sense of wanting the participation to be meaningful and to be part of the conversation in a way that leads to the best possible outcome. But we need to see more, I think, from the developers in terms of what they're actually going to provide. And this idea of having a single ground floor under a residential block, which is exactly what's happening with this building as well, feels like not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. That, is that what you're being offered? Sorry, yeah, I misunderstood really that. Offered. Yes, that's what we're That doing. is so depressing. I, uh, yeah, all right, I'm on the campaign. Right. <laughs> We know um, HMM because because there's just something about I don't know. It depends on what the what's the floor to ceiling. Is it one story or two stories? Sorry, yeah. I didn't pick that up. Mezzanine. So one story. Yeah. Mezzanine. Hmm. We'll send you the brief, <laughs> and you're very welcome aboard. Yeah, it's I not even a really decent square meterage either, is it? it? The um, the footprint of the of the proposal is just tiny little unit basically but that you couldn't even fit any of the the kind of social infrastructure that was that existed in the prison beforehand nowhere near by by about a 20th or something like that absolutely we're being offered 1320 square meters at the moment just to offer a home for services and to offer the kind of genuine flexibility as well as security to those places um, at that, I'm really sorry, but I'm afraid we're five minutes over, so I really should wrap it up at that. But thank you so much to all of you for your participation and um, some really wonderful and inspiring talks from all of you. So thank you, Christine, to Helen, to uh, Liza and to Edit Collective, Alicia and Sophie.